You see what I did there at the end of the last video? Steven Seagal is going to have to make an executive decision. A bit of clever wordplay, I have to say. Folks, I know it's October and September Seagal month is pretty much over. But you know what? I want to continue with this. I want to continue reviewing Steven Seagal films. I want to go through all of his theatrical releases before he ended up in direct-to-DVD hell. So, we're going to continue with this. Hmm. What should I call this month? Seagaltober month? Hey, it actually works. Yeah, Seagaltober month. Oh man, we could make this work. We could totally make this work. Anyway, executive decision. Now this film is pretty interesting for a couple of reasons. One, this was released back in 1996, a couple of years before 9-11 occurred. Some would say it's a bit of foreshadowing, but you know what? I kind of disagree. Mainly because this was released after the Twin Towers bombing, which happened in 1993. Hell, you had hijackings as far back as the 1970s. Another reason is that this is the first film where Steven Seagal plays a side character. That's right, this is not a Seagal film, even though he's in it. Oh boy, that must have really pissed him off. Look at this, he's even given top billing, even though he's only in a few scenes. So, who is starring in this film? Well, you got the incredible Kurt Russell, Holly Berry, John Leguizamo, Oliver Platt, David Suchet, Joe Morton, JT frickin' Walsh. Uh-oh, Steven, we might be in trouble. These are some serious talent behind the film. There might be a risk of upstaging you, but we'll see what happens. So, our movie starts out with some text saying some nerve toxins called DZ-5, developed by the Soviets, was stolen, and it's being held at this Chechen Mafia safe house. A US Special Forces team has infiltrated the compound, and they're being led by our man Steven Seagal, playing Lieutenant Colonel Austin Travis. <laughs> Way to stick it to them! What do they call it? A Travis Burger. I need a food named after me. I know, Seagal Spaghetti. Nah, it doesn't roll off the tongue. They head inside and waste some fools along the way. Knock knock, fuckers! So far, it's an awesome scene. It's almost like a Seagal flick, but don't get too comfortable. They head into the basement and find that the toxins are not there. Alright folks, walk it off, we can recover from this. Three months later, we're introduced to Kurt Russell's character, David Grant, a U.S. Army intelligence consultant that has taken flying lessons. Gee, I wonder if a scene like this will show up later on in the movie. His instructor believes he's ready to fly solo, but just before he does, he gets intercepted by his colleague. It's happened! Uh, okay, what happened? I think it has something to do with the men being shot here. It turns out well-known terrorist leader Al-Sayed Yaffa has been captured. Grant here takes the time to make an airplane pun. Well, we wanted him and now we got him. And all the baggage that goes with it. Meanwhile, at this airport in Greece, people are boarding on Flight 343, where most of the movie will take place. Those people include Senator Mavros and his entourage. Whoa, you see that? You see that handheld electronic keypad there? I wonder if it will become important later on. We then cut to London, where a suspicious looking man enters this restaurant. It turns out he's a suicide bomber. Oh. Well, shit. The food must have been mediocre, but not exactly blow yourself up mediocre. During mid-flight, this Colonel Sanders look-alike gets up from his seat, grabs his bag, and heads to the bathroom. Kind of weird taking your carry-on into a small-ass bathroom. Uh-oh, turns out he's one of the terrorists. Ditching his disguise, he's actually Naji Hassan, second-in-command of the terrorist organization. His other members get ready to take over the plane. What? How did they smuggle rifles on board? Look, I know it was 1996, but even by then, they would have some sort of robust security in place. It's a miracle they managed to smuggle all those weapons on board, let alone the Glock. Speaking of Glock, I think that's a Glock 7 porcelain gun made in Germany. Is the reason why Mr. Hassan was able to smuggle it on board. It's gonna cost more than you make in a month. You'd be surprised what I make in a month. <laughs> yeah, Glock 7. I, I still can't get over that scene from Die Hard 2. I, I still can't. It's just... Oh. One of them blasts open the door to the cockpit. 
Just your airspeed is indicated. Careful. I am a pilot. You know who else is a pilot? Steven Seagal. You can fly that helicopter. Yeah. So the plane is taken over. This Wilford Brimley lookalike wisely decides to hide his gun and air marshal badge. At this ball party, Mr. Grant himself is looking fly. He's getting ready to pick up this chick with a pair of tickets to a hockey game. Michelle, you like hockey? Love it. Alright, I got two tickets. Excuse me, are you Dr. Grant? Ah, freaking cock block. What a shame. The Pentagon received word of the hijacking, so everyone is gathered. And there's our man, looking sharp. Turns out the faulty intel for the safe house raid was from Grant himself. That's why Travis is pissed at him. Yeah, that's right, walk past him. We don't need that negative juju here. We're trying to upstage a movie. So the terrorists demand the release of their leader, and the Pentagon is left with few options. Grant believes the missing DZ-5 is on the plane, and that Hassan plans to crash the plane into DC. Hassan is planning to use the DZ-5 and the airplane together as a tactical weapon. Colonel Travis has an idea on how to get on board the plane. A gentleman named Dennis Cahill, who's an engineer for ARPA, I think he could help us. They get a DARPA engineer named Cahill on the call and presents to the staff the Remora. A modified F-117 stealth bomber with a docking tunnel that expands upward. There is a problem. Successful docking tests have been made, only in a wind tunnel. Smooth service mating tests have been successful in a wind tunnel. A wind tunnel. <laughs> I love his reaction. What? Wind tunnel? Oh, we are so screwed. Colonel, I know you wrote the book on assaulting hijackers. Ah, there it is, folks. The obligatory ass kissing scene. Because Steven Seagal is the best. Like, no one ever was. The operation is greenlit. Travis requests Grant tags along. And I'd just love to have him come along. So, everyone is gathered at this airbase and board the stealth bomber. While preparing to board the plane, Grant says he'll be staying behind. But, but I stay here on this airplane, right? That's correct. But of course, we all know he's gonna end up on the plane anyway. Bomb has a short fuse then, what, my Latin ass is gonna be raining all over Greenland? I don't think so. Well, more like raining all over the Atlantic. But I see what you're saying. They pay me the big bucks. For what? To save your rat ass. That's what I wanna <laughs> hear. Ah, good old-fashioned military smack talk. I suppose now it's a good time to talk about the behind the scenes stuff, and trust me, it's pretty interesting. Like one time, according to Leguizamo, he got shoulder check hard by Steven Seagal. And, and the first day we, we get together for rehearsal with the actors and the director, he comes in, I'm in command. What I say is law. You disagree? And I started cracking, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was kidding, we were yeah, just hanging yeah. out. Yeah. And he aketoed me against the brick wall. Pow! Knocked all the air, to, air out of me. I was like, why? Why? Yeah. I mean, what I really want to say is how big and fat he is and how he runs like a bitch. But ah. <laughs> wow, Seagal, you are a prick. Uh, Steven, what are you doing? No, Steven, you can't out at Kurt Russell one-to-one. -one. You don't stand a chance. Oh, he's showing some skin. He always shows skin in his movies. That's a cheap shot. We all know Steven is out of shape. No, oh, that's okay. The Colonel wants Cahill to go up first to disable the alert switch, even though it doesn't make any sense. Colonel, I'll clip your circuit for you from the ladder. There's no reason for me to go in the plane. That's the way it's gonna be. Well, we gotta get him up into the airliner somehow. They approach the plane, activating targeting computer. Oh wait, wrong movie. They successfully link up with the plane. With a tunnel pressurized, Cahill heads up. Opening the plane hatch alerts the cockpit. Was that a short? Check him out as he awkwardly climbs up. Come on, Platt, move your fat ass. Move your fat ass, come on. Along the way, a clip is placed to disable the warning light. During the climbing, the bomber is actually pulling the plane down, creating one bumpy ride. Talk the bags. Hope there's a good movie on this flight. There is, John. It's right here. You're starring in it. The two planes are really going down. Some circuits are busted and bomb defusal expert Cappy gets knocked unconscious. Grant decides to head up to help pull Cappy into the plane. Get him out of there! Move it! Get him it! <gasps> the airliner climbs up and the tunnel begins breaking free. In one of the most shocking and heroic acts in movie history, Steven Seagal's character sacrifices himself in order to save his men and the people on board. You 
That's right, folks. Steven Seagal's character actually dies in this. Holy hell. That's pretty interesting because he's not the lead in this film, and he never gets killed off in his previous films. Funny enough, it seems most of his deaths result from him killing himself. From this film to Machete, there is a rumor going around, which I can't confirm, that according to Steven Seagal's contract, nobody can kill Steven Seagal but Seagal himself. I think there was a point in Steven Seagal's life while starring in this film that he really didn't need to play a lead character all the time, that he was willing to play a supporting character, and that, in a way, it humbled him a bit. It's a better story than the actual story, where he was so upset about being killed off, so much so that he held up the filming of his death scene for almost a day. What a drama queen. The Pentagon thinks they're dead. Well, besides Steven Seagal, who is actually dead, they go to alert status. The team has made it on board, but they have no comms to contact the Pentagon. To make matters worse, Cappy has a fractured vertebrae and needs to be immobilized. One of the pilots heads down to check what was going on. He spots Grant and the team. He hands him the burnt circuit chip and heads back up. Before closing the hatch, Mr. Hassan takes a look down. And then finally lets the pilot close the hatch. They don't know we're not on board either. They'll wait until the last possible second open for break. We've got some time. So, the team has about four hours to retake back the plane before they're blown out of the sky. The team sets up their equipment for the mission. What? Cut, cut. Steven, your character is dead. What are you doing on set? It looks like you're getting ready to blow up the plane. Before they can launch their attack on the terrorists, they have to find the DZ-5. Now, I have no doubt this is a highly sensitive, volatile device, so extra precautions have to be taken here. Da! Well, it's a good thing it wasn't behind that panel. Let's be a little bit more careful. Oh my god! They also have to identify Hassan since no one has seen him before. None of us are men. This isn't working. Maybe in the lower galley. Grant has called up Topside to help, since he's the only one who's heard his voice and can recognize it. He gets hooked up to a line that runs across to the other end of the plane. Lose the shoes, pretty boy. Whew. Hope the smell doesn't give us away. Fun fact, Liguazama was improvising his lines on set so much that it pissed off Kurt Russell. That line started a fight between the two. You gotta admit, it's a pretty funny line. Grant goes to each of the camera probes and tries to ID Hassan, but no luck. Meanwhile, Senator Mavros' aide convinces him that negotiating the release of the hostages could help secure a win in his presidential run. Remember the mileage that Jesse Jackson got when he negotiated the release of those hostages? While being reeled down, Grant gets spotted by Gene. This is the moment where Grant immediately recognizes the voice of Hassan. He tells her to move out of the way of the galley elevator, and when he looks inside, like magic, Grant has disappeared. Meanwhile, Senator Mavros introduces his proposal to Hassan. If you allow me to conduct the negotiation, I believe I can guarantee all your demands. Oh man, anybody that has seen Die Hard knows how this is gonna end. The team finds the bomb. Wait, did you just drill a hole in the case? That's kind of risky, even with the amount of precautions taken. They discover there's enough nerve agent on board to wipe out half the eastern seaboard. There's enough nerve agent here to wipe out half the eastern seaboard. Back at the Pentagon, with time running out, they make the decision to launch both fighter jets and free Yaffa. While examining the bomb, Cappy discovers it has a barometric pressure switch, which could set off the bomb on landing. So they recruit Cahill to help defuse the bomb. Doing a simple electronic bypass. Just ignore the rest of it. This is pretty funny because if Steven Seagal's character was there, he would have defused the bomb in no time because, as we all know, Steven Seagal is an expert in defusing bombs. The team gets ready to assault the plane. Grant is recruited since they don't have enough members on the strike team. Whatever you do, don't look into his eyes. Because you'll fall in love? The team is in position. Once Cahill defuses the bomb, they'll blow out the lights and take out the terrorists. Okay, Cahill. Meter reads 15 ohms. Now, as somebody who's currently going to mechanics school, well, UTI in this case, and has taken electrical classes, and trust me, 
Those were a challenge. I immediately recognize the terms they're using here. Now, ohms are a resistance is where the proper voltage is not getting through. It could be a result of bad wires, corroded wires, or in this case, a resistor is used here. I guess not to send too much voltage where it would set off the bomb. That's good, that means it's in parallel. Ah, parallel circuit. It's where the component has their own power and ground. Now, if this was a series circuit, they would all share the same power and ground. The wire is cut, and they think they defused the bomb, but it starts going ape shit. The attack is called off. Everybody hold the positions. Aw oh, man, what a tease. The thing is with this movie is that there's a lot of tension in it. It's well done tension, but a lot of it. This movie clocks in at around 2 hours and 30 minutes. Which sounds pretty long, and we still have an hour left to kill. Somebody ran a program test on the bomb, meaning someone on the plane could set it off remotely. On this private plane, Yaffa makes a call to Hassan, informing him on his release. However, Hassan still plans on going through with the attack. Yaffa desperately tries to plea with him. They will destroy the plane, Naji, listen! So now the Pentagon has no choice but to set in fighter jets to intercept the plane. Call the president. It's an executive decision now. Oh my god, oh my god, he said the line! Now that I'll be free, shall I order the plane to change course back to Algeria? Oh man, don't you hate it when it's the first day on the job and you ask your boss the stupidest question? That dude is in for a rude awakening. Well, he gets a simple answer, which is no. Dude is like, fuck you, I'm not dying. Oh yes you are. He gets shot to shit. Son of a bitch. What did you get me into here, huh? What did you get me into? But, Senator, I was only helping. Oh, I think you helped quite enough. They have to find the trigger man and decide to recruit Jean to help find the person by setting up a communications device to contact her. While on the phone, Toe Jesus! She's done for. That's the second time she was caught and let off the hook. You know what? If Seagal's character was here, he would be the communication expert here. He would be relaying information to his team they already know, but would still say something like, Nobody knows how to make calls like you, Travis. After all that, she agrees to help them. Alright, ladies and player boys, she's with us. She spots the passenger with the same electronic handheld from the beginning of the film. She shows him the seat number. Meanwhile, Cahill and Cappy realize they've been defusing a decoy and that the real trigger mechanism is located underneath. It's a decoy! It's a fucking decoy! A squadron of F-14s arrive to divert the 747 or else they'll be shot down. This is Lee. Contact 039 at 125. You've got the package, sir. Freeze contact and concur, Angels 44. Oh my god, Steven, we know that's you. Come on, man, get out of here. Grant picks up the chatter from the squadron, so with quick thinking, the two pull out some wires of the plane and try to look for the rear tail lights. Cahill discovers the contact points for the bomb. He just needs to slip in something non metallic between the points. Cahill. Well, duh! However, it turns out the contact ports are protected by a laser field. It looks like you got a straight shot through. The good senator is brought in to negotiate. However, the comparisons to Ellis from Die Hard don't end there, as he is killed. Do what they want! Blade. The squadron gets into position, ready to fire, until they get a Morse code reading via the taillights. They got it. They got it. They got it. They got it, man! They got it! I take back every rust picket squid hating thing I've ever said about swabbies. What the hell does that even mean? How about using terms we're familiar with, like... Sailor, or seaman. So, they have 10 minutes left, and they don't know if they could defuse the bomb in time. The sphere is filled with photoelectric beams. It's gonna take us a hell of a lot longer than five minutes. So Grant calls Jean to recruit her help one more time. Okay, Marla Maples, for this scene, you're tired, scared, and at your wit's end. And action. Brilliant. So now they have five minutes to defuse the bomb and another five to retake back the plane. But our man Kurt Russell has a plan of his own. Forget going with the team with a plan laid out. If you're Kurt fucking Russell, you do whatever the fuck you want on your own. Gene goes into the elevator and the two emerged. 
Grant is armed with a Heckler & Koch SOCOM pistol. It's a pretty nice pistol, I have to say. He's going after the Trigger Man. Told you he has a plan. It's not him. Hey, wait a second. It's the same guy from the beginning of the film. And in that scene, he has the keypad. Why change it in the middle of filming? Anyway, the real Trigger Man has been found. Now, in mere seconds, it gets crazy. The team rushes in and kills most of the terrorists. Meanwhile, a struggle ensues over the handheld. Oh no! Grant gets his leg trapped. Well, the Trigger Man gets shot, but still manages to activate the bomb. Luckily, Cahill manages to slip the straw in between the contact points. One of the terrorists shoots a hole in the side of the plane. Hey, we gotta throw in some civilian casualties somehow. It's edge of your seat stuff, and it's pretty exciting. Too bad Pie Man's not here. If he were, then he would have Aikido chopped some baddies, shot the rest all by himself. The straw is at risk of coming out, so Cahill heroically just pushes the straw in a little bit further. Huh. Hassan is still alive and shoots Rat in the back. Grant seizes and we get our showdown. Who are you? No one. Nobody? Oh, come on, Kurt. Don't be so modest. Hassan shoots the cockpit, killing both pilots. However, Rat is still alive and shoots him. So now Grant has to land the plane. Oh, I see. That's why the scene of him taking lessons was in the film. Pretty clever. If Seagal was here, he would have been like, don't worry, I could land this. Do you think I'm crazy? No, man. Wrong answer. I am crazy. It's a pretty intense scene. Power up throttle. Power down. Landing gear. Yeah, I can see his training being put to good use. He misses the landing strip, but then he spots the landing strip of his flight school and flies over there. He lands the plane with much needed property damage. Things almost land themselves, don't they? Everyone gets off safely. Grant has earned the respect of the team. Damn it, Seagal, get out of here! Mr. Ladies Man puts his moves on Gene. Do you like hockey? Hockey? No. I only like baseball. And that was Executive Decision. It's got a simple story, but it's backed up by the incredible cast, well done tension, and all around, it's a great film. Oh yes, we can't forget about the ponytail wonder himself. I have no doubt after this film, he vows never to die ever again in future films. Oh, we'll see about that.